degrees. Yes. So uh, I'm, I'm applying, so uh, this is counting up to multiplicity, right? So, so it's an increasing sequence? Um, any, any sequence you like, but yeah, sure, we can make it increasing to make sure there's no redundancy in this specification. So it's multi set in zero. Say that again? It's a multi set. Yes, in that's zero. right. It's a multi set. Yes. So uh, the reason I'm talking about Hodge degrees is because that irregular word um, is is some adjective associated to the Hodge degrees. So it could be M also. Say that again. There is no negative number. There's uh, no Z. The Hodge degrees could be negative. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay, so um, right. So once again, I've, I've said what the emitted G stack is, and even though it's technically not entirely just the stack of Galois representations, that's how we are thinking of it for the purposes of this talk. And secondly, I described what Hodge state weights are, and I've said that there are these loci on the uh, on the emitted G stack, which are really the loci of potentially crystalline representations of a certain Hodge state uh, type and of a certain inertia type. Uh, and now, uh, the, the fact that it's flat over Swift O is slightly relevant, is quite relevant because, um, so maybe I'll say this here. So the, in the, if you look at this uh, closed substack, uh, XRT, then it's F points or F bar points. Or, I mean, I could have replaced O with any finite flat thing over O. So it's F points are um, mod P reductions. Of um, these potentially crystalline representations given by classified by this R tau data. Okay, so all of the mod P points are actually lifted by such a representation. Okay, so yes. Um, so um, you take the, you define it by taking the flat part of it. So this is all defined over O, which is a DDR. Yes. And so that's just one, you just need to kill torsion by the uniformizer of O. So you define some closed substack, and then you kill the torsion by that uniformizer. Um, and then you get the flat part of the- Oh, so that's the definition. Yeah, it, yes. But it's, I mean, I see this as a property because this makes it unique. The assertion, the making it flat, forcing it to be flat, and forcing these to be the points, makes it a uniquely defined uh, uh, closed stack. All right, so uh, right, so we have this, um, and now let's say now what, what, what I want to study is okay. So let me actually also take d equals two. So henceforth, the only evidence stack we'll be looking at is that of a kind of a GL two. And, and I'm going to basically omit all the Ds from the notation. So X2 is just X now. And we will look at, uh, and let the, okay, so, so we will do, 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 right. So there is a X reduced is the reduced part of X. So, um, right, so it's a reduced part of X. Uh, in other words, it's, seen it's okay so in other words it's a part seen by the reduced algebras if you think of this as something that takes this test object artinian uh, algebras so this is really defined over f okay, so because you have to cut out the formal directions in uh, in o in of o so this is the reduced part of x and this turns out to be an algebraic stack Good news, we are no longer in the end algebraic setting, we are in an algebraic, step, algebraic stack setting, uh, which just means that it admits a smooth cover from a finite, from finite type uh, F uh, scheme and some a couple of other things. But okay, so this is this is our algebraic stack. This is the object of our of our study. And right, so here's my goal. Uh, study the X. Uh, so I take some any hot some hot state uh, weights are I take the trivial thing type trivial inertial type um, and I take the reduced locus 
of this uh, XR trivial. And I studied this inside of X reduced. Okay, so this is this is what we are uh, we talking about today. So what is this? This is because the inertial type is taken to be trivial. These are really the crystalline representations uh, with Hoch state weights um, R. And because it would be the reduced part, so this is so this is the actually I'm just going to call it XR because the uh, inertial type is always trivial. So this is the so this is the uh, locus of mod p representations uh, with crystalline lifts, so no longer potentially because the uh, inertial type is trivial, with crystalline lifts or Hoch state weights are Hoch state weight given. When you take your reduced part, you may first go to the finite field and then reduce. Yes, yes. You can define the reduced part directly as well. So, yeah, that would do it. Okay, so um, I'll justify this goal a little bit more in part three, which is more background. But for now, at least, uh, any questions about the statement of uh, what we intend to study? So again, to summarize, we have the 17G stack, stack of Galois representations. We have this data of Hoch state weights, and we have these inertial types, and we have these loci, which are looking at potentially crystalline representations of those Hoch state weights and those inertial types. And we've now forgotten about the inertial types, so we're really looking at crystalline representations and not just potentially crystalline representations. And we are studying the mod P representations, which admit such limits. Why did you introduce the inertial type if you want to get rid of Because uh, I will use the inertial type when I use this structure to study these loci. So essentially, uh, we, will, we will embed these loci into other loci for other Hoch state weights and varying thing uh, inertial types. And that's how we study them. OK, so all right. So let me uh, explain what I mean by the irregular thing. So, right, so this is conventions on Hoch state weights. Um, so, okay, so R is this R kappa thing, where kappa is uh, parameterizing all the embeddings of K into E, and each R kappa is Two integers, so R kappa one and R kappa two, uh, and um, and one of the standing assumptions uh, we'll make throughout this talk is that so the, I'll, I'll call this delta R kappa. This is the absolute difference between these two Hoch state weights, R kappa one minus R kappa two. Um, so this will take to be less than equal to P. So this is a standing assumption for the entirety of this talk. So all the Hoch state weights have small differences in some sense. Uh, and I mean, I'm saying anything about this again, but every single time we talk about it, this is a standing assumption. So um, it might seem a bit arbitrary, and in principle it is in some sense, but somehow the tools we're using are conducive to this. And also, this is related to the problem of minimal weight of a modular form and you are and so it's let me not say anything about it for now i'll come back to it okay so we say that r is regular if um the differences in Hoch state weights are bigger than zero for each kappa so that's the first term I want to introduce. So regularity just says that the Hoch state weights are distinct, and irregularity is saying that they're not necessarily, uh, they're not always distinct. For some kappa, they're not uh, distinct. No, no relation between different embeddings, and this is a condition, yes, for each embedding. So irregularity uh, could mean that in just one embedding, 
they have the same hot state weights, it could mean that in every embedding, which is a completely regular case, uh, they could have uh, uh, they could have the same hot weights. Another uh, term I'll speak of is, but maybe I'll uh, I won't speak of it too much. So we'll say that R is Steinberg if uh, each delta r kappa is p. So this is the extreme case in the maximal difference situation. So all of the uh, Hauschwitz weight differences are p. And the non-Steinberg case is uh, if some uh, difference is less than p. So in particular, the objective of this, uh, uh, this article that, or this talk is that uh, we want to study the irregular loci, which means we want to study loci in which, at least in some embedding, the difference is uh, equal to zero. So in particular, they're always non-Steinberg. Right? So for the purposes of this talk, we can sort of ignore the Steinberg case. Okay, so let me state our main results. So turn one. Um, okay, so I'll say that's maybe I'll state it first and then I'll attribute more people to it than just us. So this locus, the locus of mod P representations admitting crystalline lifts with horseshoe plates are, this locus is irreducible when, um, when R is not Steinberg, which is uh, completely irrelevant for us anyway. But uh, so here I take R to be any harsh rate weights, of course, sufficiently small, the differences are no bigger than P. And in this situation, the locus is irreducible. Uh, so this is, uh, this has been proven in the regular case. Uh, so there is uh, paper by Kayani, Emmett and G and Savit. So they show it, uh, for R regular, which means none of the differences are zero. And, um, and but they don't make the exception for non-Steinberg, so they include both Steinberg and non-Steinberg. Uh, and us, well, we show it for R regular or irregular. So our proof is slightly different, quite different in, in theory from the Karanian and GSAR proof. But we do require the non-Steinberg condition to, uh, to speak of the regular case. Okay. Uh, okay, two. Actually, you can, you can say that this is irreducible if and only if R is non-Steinberg uh, based on Karani and Tintu and Savitz results. Can you repeat what the result was? So you are uh, in one second, two. And, uh... Right, so, the, so we are in dimension two, and I'm looking at the locus of mod P representation, reduced locus of mod P representations, admitting crystalline lifts with some harsh rate weights that satisfy this, uh, this crucial condition, right? The differences are always less than 50. And I claim that um, this uh, locus is irreducible. This is a closed algebraic substack of a reduced part of the Hamilton G stack. And this is an irreducible uh, locus. Um, and in fact, uh, this turns out to be an irreducible component when R is regular and of strictly smaller dimension when R is irregular. Uh, but, but anyway, so the, main, the first statement is that it's irreducible. Okay. Any, uh, any questions? The irreducible is geometrically irreducible? Yes, it's geometrically irreducible. Right, so the second. So the second uh, theorem is that let's say you have irregularity in some embedding. So that uh, uh, R kappa is zero for some kappa. Then uh, you can define operators so that exist operators on our sheet weights, uh, so mu kappa, theta kappa, and mu kappa, um, such that if you have another Hauschwitz weight 
which is in the image of either of these three operators. So mu kappa r, theta kappa r, and mu kappa r, then our, um, our locus lives inside uh, this r prime locus. Um, and the this so this in the case f equals two um, some of these inclusions so ignoring the new part the mu and theta inclusions have been uh, have been studied well there's a lemma of Diamond and Sasaki which gives these inclusions uh, and so what, what are the domain and codomain of Right. So they take Hoshit weights weights and the output Hoshit weights. Thanks. Um, and in some cases, so they assume irregular in one embedding, but regular in the other embedding, and f equals two, and they show inclusions in uh, for these two operators. In f equals three, there are some cases uh, that have been studied by uh, Hanna Kavirsama, who is also co-author on this paper. Again, for uh, this operator and this operator, so essentially, their um, their work is motivated by geometric modularity, and in particular, things about something called partial Hasse invariants and partial theta operators. But this work is, uh, I mean, this is this these, this is a different different kind of modularity we're looking at. We're looking at crystalline lengths and not uh, and not the weights of modular forms coming from line bundles and such. Right. So just to restate what I'm trying to say here: whenever you have an irregularity then you can define other hot state weights and you can show an inclusion of one into the other. So it's regular or not? It may or may, or may not be regular. Sorry? It may or may not be regular. You could take R equals R prime, then, so. Say that again? You could take R equals R prime, so. Yeah, yeah, so the operators will always change R. So the operators are, right, so they will always change R, but the new R prime you get may not be regular. Um, and, and what happens if you repeat the process? So at some point it will dominate. Um, right. So at some point it will dominate, and you can get uh, a new. Uh, you can get a regular uh, hot shape out of it. It will be a regular. Yeah. Ultimately, but so in one application it may not be, but then you could apply it to R prime and get some other inclusions, and you could keep going, and at some stage it will become regular. Oh. And in the whole process, this standing assumption will still be satisfied? Yes. So throughout the talk, the differences will always be less than equal to p. And the operators are defined in this particular setting so that they're sort of manufactured in such a way that they always produce something bounded uh, by p. Right. So one, one thing you might think of is, OK, so this is entirely a statement about uh, the finite field points. Right? It's, not, it's not telling anything much about the um, how these really live inside of it. Uh, one thing maybe we can say is that when you have irreg irregularity at just one embedding, then you get all possible inclusions in this way. Uh, so you don't lose out on anything. Uh, all possible inclusions of such uh, loci into other small crystalline loci. Um, another thing maybe you could say is that in the F equals two setting, if you look at any two of these and you look at the intersection of those, then you get all possible points like, and then that basically equals your original locus you started with. So there may be a few more statements you can make, but this is essentially a comparison of finite time points and not so much uh, a, a statement about how this sits inside the intersection. Yes. So these operators, they change also other positive weights and other. Yes. So they would change at either, let's say, kappa embedding or at uh, Frobenius. Uh, composed with kappa, or maybe they could change at kappa or Fubinius inverse composed with kappa. So uh, at two embeddings, they will change the Hoshik weights at two embeddings. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. What is the definition of the stack XR reduced one more time? So XR reduced is, uh, so to define the stack, um, the straightforward way is you find a closed substack of the full Hamilton G stack which is the stack of potentially crystalline representations with Hoshi plates R and um, inertial type tau. And um, if you take tau to be trivial, 
So that means you're looking at crystalline representations with Hodge state weights R, and you look at the reduced locus of those representations. So the, the which is equal to the reduced closure of the finite field points. So if you look at that locus, these are the mod p reductions of crystalline representations with Hodge state weights R. That locus is XR reduced. So this is uh, once again this is the reduced closure of mod p representations that admit crystalline lifts with Hodge state weights R. But you cannot describe it on its functor points after taking reduced points, correct? I mean, uh, yeah, great. Can you tell something about the dimensions? Yes. So uh, the dimension is uh, the number of irregularities. Okay. So what happens is if you are regular, then these are exactly uh, the irreducible components of the reduced part of the amplitude stack. And I'll maybe say a bit more about it in a second. But um, for every irregularity, you lose one dimension. Yes. Okay. Can you remind me what F? Uh, what is again? Oh, I, I never, I never said what it was. I'm so sorry. So this is, uh, this is K, the dimension of K over QP, which is unramified over QP. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Could you say, could you say again what the like, non-triviality statement was? Like, what, so, yeah, what, what, this just said, what, what do we know about, uh, so, so this is just saying that uh, you have these this crystalline this locus of mod p representations, and you want to see how it interacts with the other. But, so you said R, when is R prime like not just is R prime always just not just R? Or I, I'm, I'm confused. R prime is never R. R prime is. R prime is never R, but what oh, is okay. what what you have in R prime could be uh, okay. could still be regular. Yeah. And you said it always eventually so. Eventually, eventually. Yes. Enough of these? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So with this new thing, you have some of imagination occurring. So you keep being a crystalline with no uh, inertia axon. Yes, so far. So until I uh, until I talk, start talking about the strategy, I'll essentially always be the statement is entirely about uh, Crystalline. crystalline representations, but to study this locus, we do use potentially crystalline representations. Any other questions? Sorry, so eventually you always get a lift with regular hash state weights? Yeah, if you keep applying these operators long enough. Is that like a non statement? That... Uh, sorry, say that again? Sorry, is that a non statement that every mod here? Is... Yes, yes, so this that is, but and the proof of the statement is comes from the theory of Hamilton G stack. So it was only proven with the help of Hamilton G stacks, and that is a that is a known statement that every modern representation admits um, a crystalline lift. But I guess it's not, and because we know that the irreducible components are uh, the regular crystalline lifts, which somehow comes out of the work of Karyani, Hamilton G, and Simon, uh, and therefore we know that this has to be contained in some irreducible component, especially because we know it's irreducible. And that shows that uh, an, an irregular um, an irregular crystalline lift implies a regular crystalline lift. All right, so. So let me say a little bit more about uh, where this whole story sits. So, okay, so we have these uh, regular Hodge state weights. And from these regular Hodge state weights, um, one could produce what I call uh, or irreducible mod p representations of um, GL2 of OK, where OK is the ring of integers of K. And this is uh, some sort of numerical formula that, um, that comes from the work of G. Liu Savit. And 
I'll say what the point of this map is in a second, but you have the subjective map from regular Hochschild weights, always P bounded, so the difference is always is equal to P, to these uh, irreducible mod P representations of GLT of OK, which are in one to one bijection. Uh, so this is almost true, or at least this is true in the non Steinberg setting, with um, the irreducible components of the MNG stack. It's always D equals two situations of that word, just two integers. Um, so for this one, right, so there are two integers for every embedding of K into. Uh, oh, yes, right here, right. yes, yes. Right yes, so something like let's say if you have minus S kappa one, where S kappa is uh, between zero and T minus one. So if you have this sort of data, then you can send it to like sim S kappa of the standard two dimensional representation of GL2 of the residue field and maybe change the coefficients from F to or from uh, from. from K to F. But anyway, like you can just produce a. I'll just erase this because I don't want to uh, get too much into it. So you can just input some regular Hochstedt weights, and the fiber is infinite, uh, but the differences don't change in the fiber. And, uh, the differences are well defined uh, for the fiber. And, um, and you produce this uh, subjective map. And these are in one to one uh, bijection with the reducible components of X reduce. I'm lying because it's only true in the non Steinberg setting, the one to one bijection. But, um, but it's, I mean, it's still true, but okay, it's always true. But the bijection is sort of a Lang Lanz type of statement or a Broimis art conjecture type of statement. If, if you know what that means, if you don't, don't worry about it. This is not. Um, is not super important for you. So the point is that you can, in the periodic climates correspondence, you can create a sheaf out of these, and the support of these sheaves gives you the reducible component of the. Speak of mod p and what is the coefficient? So uh, all these, uh, so I should say over f. So irreducible representations um, on f vector spaces. So f, so f is a finite field. Yes, f is the residue field of the field of of O, which was, uh, so I, I remind you that there was this, uh, for, our stack was defined over formal spectrum of O, and the reduced part of the stack was defined over spec of F, which is the rest of the field of O. And so it can be reducible, but uh, absolutely reducible. They'll always be absolutely reducible. Right, so, um, okay, so, no, it, was, it cannot be on to the side. We have to ask for it. So these, if something is irreducible um, over F, then it will stay irreducible in this case. F is sufficiently big. And these are edge break representation. For what kind of representation? I don't know. Oh, um, for, like, I just see, um, so, so this this representation will necessarily factor through GLPK because this is a uh, effector space and uh, the right so this is factor through GL2K and this is some GLNF representation and they all look like some symmetric power uh, of the standard two dimensional GL2K representation and the symmetric power is between zero and p minus one uh, and now this has coefficients in K so you have to use the embedding so there is some Kappa of little k into f, and uh, maybe you have some s kappa, and you use this embedding to change the coefficients to, uh, to f. So you look at this, and you can take determinant twists, and they say irreducible uh, regardless of whether you look them over f or f bar. Right, so. Um, Okay, so so the point is that uh, this uh, this this correspondence was studied by Karyani, Amit, and Jean and Savit in their paper, and uh, so I'm just going to erase this. Uh, so you have this. You start with some Hochstedt weights R, and you pass through this correspondence, and you get to the locus X R reduced. And what Karyani, Amit, and Jean and Savit really studied was what does this this map look like? 
And because this map was understood, uh, they could sort of conclude that these loci in the regular setting are irreducible. Um, and what they were really doing was they were, they were trying to study this promise of conjecture, which I'm not explaining. But for us, we are expanding this domain to irregular Hoche state weights. And it is not entirely clear what they should correspond to here, if they should correspond to anything at all in the direct sense or something. And so there is some sort of new version of Bragg's art conjecture that is available to us. And uh, our methodology has to be uh, necessarily different from the one that uh, Karyani, Mitenji, and Savit employed, where they, the, one of the inputs was the fact that geometric Bragg's art conjecture uh, holds for Bragg's date representations or something. Uh, I'm not saying too much about it, but it's sort of to lay out the larger context of what this uh, picture sits in. So once again, there is a Langhans story at play, but then uh, the being modular of some uh, weight ends up being equivalent to having crystalline lifts of some uh, suitable Hoche state weight in the GL2 case. Uh, and that's what's being exploited here in this uh, as a motivation for this study. So uh, still this definition of this from Hodge weight to the weights to work in you said there you need to choose some forbidness to it or something. Um what you, sorry what do you mean? So the the, the Hodge state weights there's data for each tuple and those um so I can I can identify them let's say with uh, embeddings of K into F. I'm sort of using the unramified bit here. And uh, for each embedding, and the embeddings vary by different Frobenii uh, powers of P. And so for each, so using this data, we could just write down a. But the, when you tensor them, they won't be irreducible. It will be irreducible because I'm assuming this is small. So I'm assuming that the differences in Hoche state weights are always less than equal to P. So this is what guarantees that it's irreducible. So, um, so like I said, the, the, the way the map looks is if you start with something like this, so this is R kappa, where this is in zero and P minus one, as kappa is in zero and P minus one, uh, then this maps to uh, sim S kappa, which is now a zero to P minus one range of the standard two-dimensional representation of GL to K, and then use kappa to change coefficients to F, uh, and then you can sort of all possible settings. And this is irreducible, which is uh, which is necessarily uh, related to the fact that S kappa is between zero and P minus one. If it was over P minus one, this would be a reducible representation. I think it's okay. Any other questions? What happens if you fit R1 and R2 by the same quantity? Um, say that again? If you replace R1 and R2 by R1 plus 1 and R2 plus 1. Oh, so that just adds a determinant twist. Okay. So, um, so I, I apologize for the brevity of this one. I figured I wouldn't have too much time to talk about it, but I mean, I'm happy to say more about it or I could like, sort of move on. And... I am still confused with this representation of the upstream group of algebra. Uh, this is, this is, these are the, these are representations of the okay points of this group. They are, they can be, they do arise algebraically. But uh, and you get get all of them to right? Yes. Steinberg's tensor. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm completely brushing under the rug the non -Stein, like the Steinberg case. Uh, like I said, for the irregular setting, Steinberg is anyway not important. Okay. Right, so maybe I'll just say something very, very briefly uh, about the, the Broikus and module stuff. Okay, so what Karyani, Amit, and G and Savit did was uh, they relied on a study of these things called uh, 
breakers and modules. And uh, it also modules. So I'll I'll give a very, very, uh, very brief overview of what these approximate and brief overview of what these objects are. So um, let's say, okay, so roughly mod P, and I just pretend all my questions are mod P. So if you have these things called brightness and modules um, of something called height less than equal to one. Um, this height has nothing to do with the height of a p-divisible group. Uh, this is the height related to some relative position of some mass or something. Um, so if you have this category, then due to Kisson, one knows that this is the same as the category of finite flat group schemes, p-torsion finite flat group schemes. Uh, over this thing. Uh, don't they? Don't they? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think they, they are commutative. Yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. So, okay. You're right. I have to get commutative. Um, Okay, so, right, I have to take a minute. Okay, so this, uh, and then you could take the K bar points of this, which gives you a Galois representation. So take K bar points of this black magnified group scheme, and you get um, a Galois representation out of it. And then you could, um, okay, so I'll say more. Galois representations, uh, admitting, admitting, Crystalline myths uh, with uh, harsh state plates in zero and one. So they could be zero, zero, they could be one, one, they could be zero, one, or something. Um, and now you can apply a restriction functor and you can get some representations over some widely ramified extension of K. So maybe attach all P power roots of the uniformizer. So something that is, whose completion is perfectoid. So you get this uh, and you get these representations. Right? So this is, this is some, where pi is the uniformizer. So you take all the power roots of uniformizer. And now uh, there is, you can directly define a map into what, what are called etal key modules, which in the sense I set it for phi gamma modules. So for suitable coefficients, these are three. So you have this sort of diagram and now you can, uh, okay, so if you were to sort of construct the scheme theoretic image of this map, then these are somehow the mod P representations admitting crystalline lifts with such harsh state rates, but you could uh, upgrade it. So instead of defining over K, you could take a K P ramified extension of K and you could define these over K prime and then uh, you could have plus the same data from K prime to K. So the, so the point is that finite flat group schemes don't necessarily descend over, uh, over some descent data from K prime to K, but Galois representations do. And so uh, plus some analogous condition. So when you do this, you get potentially crystalline representations uh, with uh, inertial type corresponding to the choice of this descent data and still satisfying 
this stress potential. So you've suddenly increased your scope of Galois representations you are considering. You could do a bit more. You can uh, impose some determinant conditions, which essentially force uh, this to be Hoche equates zero and one. So these are the uh, these are what are called bar sortie date. Uh, potentially by sorted date representations. So these are the ones coming from three divisible groups uh, somehow. So, um, right, so the point is that by adding some conditions to this, uh, this, this category of, or well, I'll just call it, okay, so let's say the descent data is of type tau, where again, tau is the inertial representation we were thinking of earlier. Then you get the stack C tau, and these are exactly the F points of the stack C tau. So this is the stack of Broichison modules equipped with descent data from K prime to K height less than equal to one and some determinant condition. And this exactly rigged so that it's finite type points give you all the, uh, all the potential, all the uh, Galois representations that admit potentially crystalline lifts with Hoche with zero and one. And now the key is that this restriction map ends up being uh, a fully faithful embedding into these representations. Uh, and that's related to the fact that they're coming from finite fight group schemes. Okay, so now if you look at the scheme theoretic image of this thing, so let's say the scheme theoretic image is Z tau inside of stack of alpha modules. Maybe I should I'll try to be quick. So what I'm trying to say is that, okay, so there's these other objects, these sort of integral structures that you can associate to Galois representations and that can help you study these Galois representations. And the point is that uh, the star Z, which is the union of Z tau for tau, some T inertial type, these, this is an alternative stack of Galois representations, which is a priori not the MPG stack. But on the bright side, it offers uh, this resolution from this integral structures uh, given by Broichison modules, and that really puts a lot of power to study these uh, stacks, especially because these admit local models coming from affine class modules. So this just um, this is some is another stack of Galois representations. And this was studied and constructed by Karyani, Amit, and Jean Savit. And so one of our theorems is that the, if, you, if you look at the stack, uh, so in the, the Amit and G stack, where all the, um, all the Hoche state weights are zero and one, and the inertial type is tau, then this is isomorphic to Z tau. So essentially, this M G stack can be studied via this stack of tau phi modules, substack of tau phi modules, um, and right. And, and, and the point is that, and we, you can show. Uh, so it turns out that each um, x r reduced for r irregular or regular and non-Steinberg for as long as r is non-Steinberg. This actually lives inside uh, this stack for some choice of tau. What am I saying here? So I'm saying that we want to study these loci xr. And in order to study these loci, we show, uh, first of all, or second of all, that um, this locus is actually contained in some other potentially crystalline locus. Uh, which sounds bizarre because, of course, they have some bizarre first go because they clearly have different O points. The O points are, by definition, those potentially crystalline representations with those Hoche state weights and those inertial types. But in fact, their uh, mod P points can intersect, right? And they do intersect. And in particular, these uh, crystalline loci live inside uh, some such um, some such a stack where the Hoche state type is this very particular type, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 in each embedding, and for some tame type. And these stacks have very nice models coming from uh, this chart that shows that uh, 
they are isomorphic to some substack of Itachi modules, which admits this proper uh, uh, map from the stack of Bricks modules. Um, and I think I should probably stop, but the point is that we use this inclusion in the very explicit structure of Zetaus to then uh, study the inclusion and show that these are irreducible. Yeah, I should stop here. Questions? Yes. In theorem two, you say in terms of this stuff you have in theorem three, what these operators are when k is just qp? Uh, so when, okay, so when k is qp, uh, then these operators don't make too much sense. So maybe I should say, you can still show, you can still show all possible inclusions in the anamified in, in the in the other low side, but these operators are not very meaningful in that setting. So I should have said for to define these operators, you should say this is bigger than equal to two. So I, I, I just, what, what do you mean by they're not meaningful? I mean, so okay, so let me say what mu kappa looks like. Let me just write down. I'm trying to get a trivial example. Yes. Yeah, a trivial yeah. example that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Let me shake it. So Right. So what does mu kappa do? So let's say, okay, we, again, we're assuming that our kappa is zero. The mu kappa is this thing, which let's say, what is mu kappa of R? So I'm just going to see what it does to the differences in Hashi plates. Okay, so what it does is, um, so then delta R prime kappa uh, equals the original difference plus P, and delta R prime Frobenius composed with kappa is, so here I'm giving kappa as embeddings of the residue field. This is uh, the original difference in height minus one. So that's mu. Um, the theta operator is, so in the kappa embedding, this is delta R kappa uh, plus p again, but in the uh, Frobenius uh, composed with kappa embedding, this is this become the difference becomes plus one. The new one is kind of strange in some sense. This uh, takes so delta r kappa you add one to the kappa embedding, and to the so and in the delta r Frobenius inverse composed with kappa embedding, you sort of flip the difference and reflect it around P. So, uh, so this is what it looks like. And because I have different values for kappa and Frobenius composed with kappa, it just sort of doesn't make too much sense to say them for K equals QP. But, uh, but otherwise, this is what they look like. And so for instance, let's say you have an irregularity at Frobenius composed with kappa and you apply the mu operator, you have a regularity of, let's say, uh, let's say this is one, uh, difference is one. So when you remove one, this could newly become irregular by resolving the irregularity here because you've added zero to the difference. So you can, you can keep producing more and more irregular loci, but at some point, the thing will terminate and you will get something regular out of it. So do you know anything at all uh, other than theorem one about the geometry of the stack XR reduced? Um, I mean, except for its inclusion, yeah, I mean, I can say a couple of things, but it, it's not it's not entirely, it's really still a study of the finite type points, but let me say a couple of things. So for instance, in the F equals two setting, let's say um, R is irregular in one thing. So it's regular in the other. So this is K, Q equals two. In one embedding. Then, um, then what you can show is that um, x r reduced is the intersection of is the reduced intersection. So it's always the study of level finite like points, and that's I can say more about why that is necessary, sort of. But you can have and you can take any two of your favorite things. And this equality will hold. 
So you can replace this with theta and mu, this can replace with mu and mu, whatever, and you'll always get this inequality. Another thing I can say is that, uh, so again, if for any f, if f is, again, if uh, r is irregular in one embedding, again, so the same uh, condition, then, so it's something uh, weird. So what happens is that many irreducible components intersect in co-dimension ones, right? Uh, you could have these co-dimension one intersections, and maybe these are the irreducible components of those co-dimension one intersections, but in some edge cases, you start seeing triple intersections. And the irreducible components in those uh, triple intersections are precisely these, are exactly equal to the set of these irregular crystalline loci. So they just sort of sit at the periphery of the, I mean, the, they sit in the non-generic component. They're, this is a completely non-generic picture. They sit in the non-generic components and they're exactly the top dimensional irreducible components of the co-dimension one intersections of these non-irreducible. So and that's sort of the extent of uh, what we know about how they live inside the Emitter G stack. Um, the reason I said that we can really necessarily just study the finite type points is because, um, well, maybe this, well, maybe you could study more of this, but we are studying this stack inside another uh, potentially crystalline stack. And some of the deformation theory on that stack comes from that potentially crystalline deformation of that inertia type tau and those Hodge gateways. And we are starting to study some other crystalline locus inside of it. So we can really just say something about what are the finite type points and how do they include, but we can't say too much about what is the deformation of those points in some sense. Uh, yes. Is Kairat uh, connected? Is what connected? Uh, the the Kairat. No. Oh, actually, I, didn't. I mean, I know that it's this. It's um, I know the co-dimension one points where they. It, there's no sort of co-dimension one chain that goes through, but no, they're not. It's not connected. Of course, it's not connected. Sorry. Is there like, like a similar parametrization for connected components? Uh, I I think the connected components are characterized by the determinant of the representations. So uh, maybe that's the characterization instead of uh, by the reducible representations, G2. Yes. So um, you said that in the Steinberg case, this nice correspondence on this top uh, blackboard yeah. uh, doesn't really exist. You you said there were, you like speculated maybe that there is some something that existed at the derived level or something like this. Oh no, so uh, for the Steinberg case, we know what the picture is. Uh, that's because of Perioni, Emmett, and Gian Savit. We know that if you, so this correspondence is about um, creating a sheaf out of this, taking the support of that sheaf conjecturally under a conjectural piatic Langlands functor. And if you were to do that for the Steinberg representation, then what you get is uh, two irreducible components. The support is two irreducible components and not just one irreducible component. So that's what it looks like in the Steinberg case. Um, and as for the, the thing I said about there not being a correspondence for the irreducible representations and crystalline weights is uh, for the irregular crystalline weights, irregular Hodge state weights. Okay. Uh, so for that, one doesn't know if there's anything to say. If, if, if there is, I mean, the, the periodic language correspondence is conjectured as a fully faithful functor. So presumably there's something much larger in the domain side that would give an equivalence of categories. Okay. So it sort of doesn't know where this so irregular Hodge state weight locus, what this irregular Hodge state weight locus corresponds to on the side of the representations. Okay. So, so this is this is like something speculative. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do you expect to, Excuse me. Do you expect to have operators like this for like GL three or like is this, is this special GL two? So in the in the GL two case, uh, it is special that. Have the modular of some weight is is equivalent to having crystalline weights of a specified Hodge state weights. So this is not true in GL three. Um, so so essentially, you could study some locus, but I don't know. I don't know what could be said about it. Yeah. yeah. Now, can you say anything about the inclusion of, of this X of R and the potentially crystalline stack? Like, is it an LCI? 
um, no, I can't say that it's also not. Uh, th this is sort of the extent of what I could say that okay, you take these pairwise, uh, so you take these pairwise intersections and you do lose one dimension and you get this thing. So this is the this is literally the irreducible component of this intersection, and you are losing. So this is exactly one dimension less than either of these, but that's the extent of uh, what I can say about. Do you know anything at all about the finiteness of the stack XR reduced itself? Like, is it at least like positive yeah. compact? Or it's an uh, it's an algebraic stack uh, and of dimension equal to the dimension of K over QP, and it's equidimensional. Each irreducible component has the same dimension. And Okay, if no other questions, let's bring the speaker again.